What does it say in the syllabus? Says, let's let's take a look, it says right? Two more days. It says two more days of lecture, right? <laughs> and, and that's all that matters. That's all that matters. Uh, we've been looking forward to August for a while, haven't we? <laughs> yes. And uh, August is just around the corner. Uh, since May, we've been waiting for August. So it's almost here. So what do we have left? We don't have a whole lot left. I have your exams graded. Um, overall, pretty good. Uh, the medium was around an 80%, which is, you know, pretty good overall. I did give you a few extra bonus points. I did curve it a little bit because I messed up in three places, all related to vocab. And I had a misspelling on there, as well as, uh, which gave us some confusion. And I also had two terms on there that weren't on your list. And so some of you did marvelously well guessing or taking a good stab at it. And in the end, I just gave those points back and a couple more as well. So uh, overall, not bad at all. Those exams are available for you to review upstairs. I don't think a single person went back to look at the nervous system exam. So nobody went to look at nervous system exam. And your cardiovascular exam is up there to review as well. So I always encourage it. You'll, you know, taking tests is a skill. And we get better at it as we do it more and more. And you'll become better at your testing by reviewing your exams, looking at the things you did poorly on, looking at the things you did better on, and learning from it. Doing self-assessment. Ask yourself, what could I have done differently? Did I misunderstand the question? Or did I misinterpret it? Whatever. So, so I always encourage you, go back and look at the exams. Uh, Hillary has them for you upstairs. On the final exam, what do we have? Urinary system and reproductive systems, male and female. We've only got two lectures left. So we've got the urinary system today, and then next Monday, I'll discuss both the male and female reproductive systems. You've seen the anatomy for these both in lab already this week, so that's not completely unfamiliar to you, and I'll give you a few more details about the whole story. And then vocab on this exam is what, 91 through the end, right? So let me, let me introduce that to you, and... Um, tell you how to prepare for that because it is a little bit different at the very, very end. Any questions about what's going on? Next Monday, next Monday is the lab exam. It'll be either at 2 or at 7. Your choice. Come to whichever one you want to come to. I can, I can make everybody fit, I'm pretty sure, into whichever one you choose. So if you want to come at 2 o'clock, we'll be done by 3.45 and come right into lecture. Or after lecture, we'll finish around 6.10. I'll give you a good 40 minutes or so to review, and then we'll start the exam at 7. So 2 or 7 next Monday night. Then Wednesday, and that'll be the same day as our last lecture, and then next Wednesday we'll have the, lab, the lecture exam, sorry, and that'll be in here at 4 o'clock. Uh, that'll be a full-length exam. When we're done with that, we're done. Just another 80-point exam. So what do we have left? We've got the 80-point exam. There is a, a PALS quiz. There's a quiz online to help you get ready for the second lab exam. And there's a quiz online to getting you ready for this final exam. So, and then the exam, the lab exam is 100 points. So there's 200 points left. There's 1,000 points altogether. You should see 800 points right now in your point total. 100 points, final exam in the lab. 80 points, final exam in lecture. 10 points, PALS quiz. 10 points, mastering quiz. So there's our 200 points. Mostly structure. Okay. So it's going to be a lot of models, right? We've talked everything from the eye, the ear, the brain, the spinal cord, the digestive, the endocrine, the lymphatic, the reproductive. The, I mean, there's a lot of models. Okay. And uh, so it's mostly going to be name those structures on the models. And I assure you, they are the major things. And each time we went through a quiz, I always said, you know, get out your notes and take it, make a note of the things I'm asking you on the quizzes. The, the <coughs> exam really is largely what I've already made important to you on the quizzes. So go back and think about, go back and look at your answers for the quizzes and ask yourself, you know, what structures was he looking for? Those are the major structures that I'll once again ask you on the exam. In addition to that, there's a little bit of histology, and those were all laid out in that review sheet, what the slides were that we looked at over the second half of the semester. And then there will be four stations with fetal pigs, so there'll be 12 structures labeled or pinned on the fetal pigs. It's all in that review. Oh, it is? Yep. Oh, so if you, okay. and I went through that with you in lab. So it, it, it you know, the, in lab six, 
We looked at the neuron and we looked at the spinal cord's cross section. And in lab seven, we looked at the uh, uh, small intestine that was the submucosa, mucosis, muscularis, and serosa. In lab eight and nine, I don't think we did any histology that way. That was the heart and the, le and the, and the vessels. Then the next week was uh, kidney and respiratory. We looked at the trachea. We looked at the alveoli of the lung, and we looked at the kidney when you cut into it. We saw the tubules. And then this week, you saw sperm, seminiferous tubules, um, cross-section of the penis, and the ovary. Okay? So that's, those were the slides. Right? Those are the slides, and they're all kind of laid out for you on that little review sheet as well. Okay? And then uh, vocab. 91 to the end, and this is where I screwed up, and I included two terms on your exam last that were from this first slide, 91, tripsy and tropic. So that's why I gave you a couple points back, plus a few extras on the exam. Any other uh, logistical questions? Anything else? Okay, uh, so let's just go through this vocab and uh, figure out what we've got to do. So trans, right, transcellular, transepithelial, transatlantic, whatever it is, we're going across, transdermal. Uh, tri, uh, tricyclous rodents, right, three blind mice. So tri is three, triceps brachii, a three-headed muscle. Tripsy, okay, this is the one I messed up on. Lithotripsy, we know litho means stone. If you have a kidney stone, or something like that, they may put you in a lithotripser, which is basically a sonicator, and they'll try to pulverize those stones down so that you can pass them naturally. So litho, stone, tripsy, to crush. Uh, tropic, not tropic, right? I wish it was tropical here. Uh, tropic, to be influencing. So something, as the example, something that's gonadotropic is what? It is going to influence the gonads. Right, so whenever you see this word tropic, it's influencing whatever it's referring to. So gonadotropic, for example, affecting the gonads. Um, moving on, 92. Trophy, nourishment, hypertrophy. Right, we saw that term long, long ago, hypertrophy. Uh, cells get uh, bigger. Atrophy would be muscle or some sort of cellular wasting, right? The, the lack of nourishment, wasting. Uh, tunica, we already know that term. We've seen the tunica intima and the tunica externa on vessels. You know it's a layer. Ultra, beyond, or in excess. And unicycle, uh, one wheel or uh, unicellular, a single cell organism. Urea, we'll see that a lot this today, uh, referring to the urine. Vago, recall that the vagus nerve is the wandering nerve. It was that longest cranial nerve that wandered down into the gut. So vagus means to wander. Varic, an enlarged vessel. So varicose veins, right, an enlarged vein. And then finally, vas, meaning vessel. Uh, the vas deferens, right, in the male uh, that carries the sperm. It's also called the ductus deferens. But you'll see vas or vasovasorum or vasodilation. Anything like that has referring to a vessel. <clears throat> we know ventro means toward the belly. Uh, the Appendix is sometimes called the vermiform appendix. Vermi meaning more, a worm. So certainly the, our appendix is worm-shaped. So the vermiform or just the appendix. Vitebro, the spine. Velo, hair. A single hair is a villus. So microvilli, little hair-like extensions. We know the viscera uh, are your internal organs. We take vitamins for life. So vitae, life. Vitri, glass. Remember the vitreous humor? The vitreous humor was that big glassy ball of jelly that came out of the eye. Uh, vivi, or vivi, uh, life, right? Vivacious or um, in vivo. If you hear that it, something is being done in vivo, it means that the experiment is being conducted within a living organism. If it's going up, if it's in vitro, right, it's in a glass tube typically. So in vitro, it's, a, it's an artificial experiment done in a glass tube, vitreous glass. If it's in vivo, it's being done in a living organism. And then vol, referring to volume. Zero, dry. Zero derma, dry skin. We go to the zoo to see the animals. And zyg, think um, homozygous, things coming to, uh, the same thing or pairing of zygote, right? What's the zygote? The zygote is the coming together of, the union of, the pairing of egg and sperm to make the embryo. And if something is azygous, what does it tell us? A was the very first term in our vocab, back to slide one, day one. 
is without or negating, right? So an azygous structure would be one without a pair. So name for me an azygous organ. You don't have two spleens, it's azygous. You don't have two livers, you don't have two stomachs, you don't have two hearts, right? So anything that's azygous is unpaired. There's only one of them. As far as an azygous bone, sphenoid, ethmoid, right? Those kinds of things. So an azygous, something that is not paired, right? So we're coming full circle from the first term, link the first term and the last term together. Now the rest of this, let me introduce it to you so you can go ahead and make your note cards, but I won't, I won't go through them until next time. The rest of the term, so there are only 96, quote, vocab slides. The last four or five slides will be common abbreviations that one would find in a medical chart or find on a pharmacy pad, right? When you go to the doctor, abbreviations that the doctor might use to indicate to the pharmacist, uh, should you take it twice a day or three times a day and, and that sort of thing. So what you want to do for this, and I'll start here and introduce this on Monday, but you can go ahead and make up your cards. Do the same thing as you did with the vocab. So, for example, uh, ATC uh, is abbreviation for around the clock. So if you're being told take the medication three times a day, ATC, it means that it has to be given at inter regular intervals uh, every eight hours. It can't be, you know, uh, six and then ten, whatever. It has to be very regular intervals. So all you want to do is just go down the list, BID, BID meaning twice a day, CAP for capsule, DIM for one half, that one's easy. If you're dim-witted, you're only half there. I didn't say that out loud, did I? So dim, right? Just one half. It's not hard to think about some of these things. Um, and then you're just going to make your cards up just like you normally would. There's four of these. And again, Z for teaspoon. So go ahead and make up your cards, and then I will uh, go through this list with you. It'll be our last vocabulary on Monday. What you'll have to do for this is I will give you a prescription with abbreviations used. And then you'll have to interpret what that means. So if it says in there BID, it means it's twice a day, or TID is three times a day. And um, around the clock, or stat immediately, or with or without something. So I'll talk to you more about that. But you can go ahead and make up your note cards just like you would. Uh, what's on the left is on one side. What's on the other side is the meaning. Uh, go ahead and get those cards going so that you can uh, be familiar with those terms over the weekend. So that's the end of our vocabulary. Wow, we have pretty much made it. I'll go through those terms with you on Monday, but I do expect that you'll do really well on that. Okay. Now, let's talk about the good old urinary system. The urinary system. So what do we know? What do we know about the urinary system? It always comes at the end of every anatomy course. It's always urinary followed by reproductive. Um, I always figured they do that because the urinary system, as you're going to see, really is going to tie in cardiovascular, it's going to tie in uh, respiratory. If, you're, if you have a patient who's sitting in the ICU and you are caring for them or it's one of your loved ones, uh, you know that they're going to be primarily concerned with their heart function, their lung function, and with their kidney function. Those three systems, urinary, cardiovascular, and respiratory, are going to be the thing that doctors spend the most time worrying about, right, when it comes to critical care. So we're going to see that uh, cardiovascular and, and uh, respiratory are all going to come together, if you will, as we talk about this. So the urinary system in your martini book is what chapter? I, don't know. I want to say 22. 20, sorry, 20. It's going to be, I, I believe, and I apologize. Um, well, we did respiratory, so maybe it's Yeah, 21. respiratory is 20, and urinary is 23. So on this exam, it's going to be 20, just a little bit about respiratory structures, just structures, the same structures you already know from lab. And then 23 is urinary, and then there is the reproductive chapter, okay, male and female. So the urinary system is the cleansing system. It's going to be uh, creating, not really creating waste, but it's going to be collecting the waste, isn't it? Where do these waste products come from? Why do the kidneys have to be constantly cleansing your blood? Where are these waste products coming from? Say again. Where are these coming from? Hmm. 
what is every cell in your body doing? It's taking in energy, glucose, and it's uh, taking in oxygen, and it's taking in some water, and out of it, what does it make? CO2 and energy, right, basically. And though that CO2 is a waste product. Now, what do we do? Our respiratory system does what? It blows off that, that CO2 as a waste product. But also, that CO2 and a lot of your uh, catabolism, what's catabolism? The breaking down, right, of your chemical reactions. A lot of those breakdown reactions do create waste products. And those waste products are toxic to our body. If those waste products continue to accumulate and our kidneys are not able to cleanse them adequately, then those toxic products will start to accumulate and cause some very significant problems, which is why if your kidneys aren't working, you're going to be put on dialysis. And dialysis needs to be done about every other day. And so it's very, very important that we keep the blood clean, and the, and the urinary system does that for us. Now, what it's going to do, it's going to be uh, basically uh, filtering out your plasma of your blood and creating urine. All right, so we're going to talk about how that urine is produced a little bit today. You know the gross anatomy of this. It's not that hard. There's a couple kidneys, a couple of ureters, the bladder, and then the urethra, which will transport the urine out of the body. Let's go through the major structures here. This looks a lot like your uh, model in the lab, and you've seen this slide already in lab. So what do we have here? I'll point and you tell me. Kidney. Adrenal gland. The ureter. The bladder. And the urethra. Um, going, the blue one here is what? Renal vein. The red would be the renal artery. Uh, this is the descending or just regular, the aorta. And uh, this is the inferior vena cava. Now, what's missing here? What's been removed so that we can see all this? Right? There's no digestive organs here. So the, the liver and the stomach and the pancreas and all of that has been removed. In fact, all of the abdominal pelvic cavity has been removed. And you're actually peeking back behind the entire abdominal pelvic cavity because the kidneys and all of the urinary structure are considered what? Retroperitoneal, right? They're behind the peritoneum. All that has been ripped out to create this image. From the back, um, you should appreciate that the kidney is an awfully important organ, kidneys. But they're not as well protected as most of our vital organs. I mean, the brain is protected by the cranium, the the heart has the sternum and the vertebra and the, and the ribs. The, the kidneys are sort of precariously located, and they don't have a lot of bony protection around them. Really, all they have is a little bit of the floating ribs. Remember, the 12th and 11th rib are the floating ribs. And those can create trouble. Uh, if you are hit from behind football or trauma or some sort of accident, those floating ribs have the ability of snapping off and, and snapping and damaging the kidney. And that's a, it's a major issue, right? If the, if the kidney gets damaged and hemorrhages, um, you can easily lose a kidney that way. So to increase the protection around the kidney, we're going to see that there are some layers of fat. And these layers of fat are also going to be, there's more fat probably around the kidney than any of your other organs. And that extra layer of fat is going to help protect everything. You can see, though, that the bladder is quite protected by the coccyx. But again, that's a potential problem, isn't it? Because you got a little pointy coccyx there. So hit and you know, break that tailbone off in just the right way, and you could damage the bladder. And you can see in this cartoon that coming down from the kidney, you can see in the picture there, there's a little bit of a ureter coming down. Okay? So you got the ureters going down to the bladder. In uh, a cadaver, let's take a look at what we can recognize. I, the first thing that I'm struck by looking at this, I'm looking at the aorta versus the, the inferior vena cava. Okay, so look at this image and tell me if you can't even appreciate this just from an image. This is the aorta. It looks round, it looks muscular, it looks like if you push back on it, there'd be resistance. Then look right next to it. That very flattened thing, that is the inferior vena cava. So you can really appreciate that when the blood has been removed, uh, 
you know, they're not red or blue, but you can tell the difference there. And they're traveling pretty much side by side. And of course, what would this be? These would be the common iliac arteries, and this would be part of the common iliac vein. Right, can you see that? Uh, see the kidneys pretty easily. See the, what do we call the area of the kidney where everything goes in or out of the kidney? The hilum, right? So the hilum, H-I-L-U-M. And then coming out of the hilum would be the ureter. We see it coming down. This is the bladder. It doesn't look like much, but that would be an empty bladder, right? Looks more like a, a tube than it does a, what we would think of for the bladder. And that's really all I really want you to see in this picture is that, um, you know, these things are all very identifiable in your body if you were to take a look. Now, we've already said that the kidneys and the urinary system is removing waste products from your bloodstream. Of course, it's, it's uh, storing the urine that it does create, your bladder, again, depending upon your size, uh, and differences can hold about a liter of urine. Uh, we're only going to urinate maybe one to two liters every day. Uh, we're going to excrete that urine through the urethra. And uh, the kidneys are going to be also uh, rather significantly involved with regulating your blood volume. If we get rid of blood volume, then blood pressure goes down. And how do we get rid of that blood volume? Urination, right? So we can definitely play around with fluid levels, and fluid levels will have a direct impact on the body's fluid levels and the blood pressure. And then finally, you've heard us talk about this a couple times. Uh, the kidneys, well, I'll say this to you. The kidneys need to have sufficient oxygen and blood. Well, that's true of any organ. But the kidneys are pretty sensitive. And if there isn't enough blood, aka there isn't enough oxygen, going to the kidneys, they really get upset. And they actually start to degenerate pretty quickly. And so they have a, a safeguard in place. So when the kidney isn't getting enough blood or oxygen, it sends out a hormone called EPO, erythropoietin. And what this EPO is going to do, abbreviated EPO, what this erythropoietin is going to do is tell the body to make more what? Erythro, red blood cells, poe, formation of, production of. Right, so this is a hormone, IN, ends in a protein, uh, IN. It's a protein hormone that is going to circulate through the blood. And where is it going to go? From the kidney to where? Where do we make red blood cells? In the bone marrow, right? So we're going to send this signal from the kidney through the blood to the red bone marrow, and the red bone marrow is then going to make more erythrocytes. And now what will happen? More erythrocytes will drive up what? Oxygen levels. What else will it drive up? We know another term. More red blood cells means a higher what? Hematocrit, perfect, right? So if you think about the percentage of your blood that is composed of red blood cells, that, that red band at the bottom of the tube, that's your hematocrit value. So if you have more EPO, you'll increase your hematocrit. EPO is being given to chemo patients to help them through the uh, staging or the uh, side effects of chemotherapy. One of the side effects of chemo, well, first of all, what does chemo do? What's the purpose of chemotherapy? To kill the cancer cells, right? The problem is it also kills everything else that's growing fast. So we, we give people chemotherapy agents, and those chemotherapy agents are designed to be taken up by rapidly growing cells like a tumor. But what else is rapidly growing in our body? Hair. So we lose our hair. What is, what's another, common, another side effect of chemotherapy? Nausea. Nausea. Why? Nausea and vomiting and diarrhea, why? The epithelial cells lining that whole gut tube are rapidly growing. So the chemo agents are being taken up by those rapidly growing digestive cells. So, di you know, indigestion, nausea, vomiting. Things don't taste right, right? Because the epithelial cells of the tongue are being wiped off. All the taste buds are being destroyed. They also are growing very, very fast. What else, what else do these people complain about? Low energy. Why do they have low energy? Their red blood cells get wiped out because they're rapidly growing. So we give patients EPO to try to replace that low red blood cell count. 
they, these patients also become immunocompromised, don't they? Because their white blood cells are getting wiped out. So their immune system gets destroyed, and they tend not to clot. They, they tend to bleed too much, uh, become very prone to bleeding, again, because their platelets get wiped out. Right? So their red cells, their white cells, their platelets, their hair, their gut lining, all of those things are damaged by the chemo agents, but the trade-off is hopefully also we're killing off the tumor, right? Okay. So the kidneys. We've seen some of these slides uh, in lab. So the kidneys are retroperitoneal. That is, they are back behind. Retro meaning behind. They're behind the peritoneum. Uh, we have that hilum, that little concave uh, indentation where everything's going into or out of the kidney. That would be the ureter, the renal vein, the renal artery. There's some nerves traveling in there as well. Uh, then, if we look at the layers on the kidney itself, if I could touch the, touch the kidney directly, the outer layer would be called the renal capsule or the fibrous capsule. That's that kidney bean colored coating, if you will. It's the uh, tough connective tissue layer on the outside of the kidney. Then there'd be a layer of fat, and that layer of fat would be called the perinephric around the kidney. Then there would be a layer of saran wrap uh, referred to as the renal fascia. Now, you know that fascia means a band, right, or a bundle. So fascia um, is a thin band of tissue, almost like a saran wrap, that's going to basically hold the kidneys in their place along the back of the abdominal pelvic wall. And then there's going to be another layer of fat called the paranephric fat, the fat that is what? Next to or near the kidney. And I'll show you a picture with the layers of fat in a moment. If I cut into the kidney, you already know what to expect. The kidney is a solid organ, so we're going to have terms like cortex and medulla to describe it. So the outer layer would be the cortical region or the cortex, and the meaty middle would be the medulla. And what do we find in the medulla? Pyramids. And between the pyramids, there are columns. Okay, so the pyramids are separated by columns. Somewhere between 8 and 15, typically, uh, of these pyramids. And then each of these pyramids, I'll go to the picture. Oops, where's my picture? There's my picture, and I'll go back. So let's go through this. So, um, so if I touch the outside of the kidney, what am I touching? Fibrous capsule, right? And then if I cut into the kidney, this bracketed area going all the way around, all that would be the cortex. The meaty middle would be the medulla. And the medulla is broken up into, in this case I can see one, two, three, four, five, six pyramids. And those pyramids are all separated by columns, right? So the columns are separating the pyramids. That's all in the middle medulla medullary region. Um, then each of the pyramids, if I just zoom into one pyramid, kind of overemphasize it, it comes to a point, right, to an apex, and each of those apices is going to dump into a, a collecting area called a minor calyx first, right? The minor calyx, there's one minor calyx for each apex, each point of a pyramid, and then many, two or three of those minor calyces would merge into a larger area called a major calyx. So this would be a major calyx in here because it's collecting from two or three of these minor calyces. And then all of those, uh, all those major calyces would merge into a area called the renal pelvis. And then the renal pelvis, that's the final basin, right, the collection area of all the urine. And now we're going to travel down the ureter. Um, again, this region where everything's going in or out of the kidney is the hilum. Oh, I told you I was going to go back, didn't I? So here's the actual kidney. Now, this actually looks better than the one I showed you in lab. Uh, they're not the most impressive organ when you cut into them. They're not as gee whiz as the heart by any means. Uh, but this one does a pretty nice job, um, this, this cut. So let me work backwards. So if you were going to work backwards, what would we have? This would be the ureter, ureter going up into the renal pelvis. pelvis and then into some larger collection areas called major calyces. And then those major calyces would go up into individual 
minor calyces, calyx, calyces plural. And again, I can see the pyramids. I can see evidence of pyramids, and that would all be part of the medulla, and then the outside layer would be the cortex. We got that. Now, let's take a look. This is going back again. Uh, let's take a look at how the kidneys are sitting in the body. We've taken a slice, as you can see in the upper left. We're taking a, a slice right across abdominal pelvic region. We're going around at about L2, just to give you an idea. This slice is about L1 or L2. The renal artery, the renal vein, all that stuff is so right about the same place where your spinal cord ends. All right, because we just saw the floating ribs, and where are they? T12, right? And they're coming around near L1 at the kidneys. And uh, what is this organ, this white organ here? That's the pancreas, good. And it kind of lies, if you will, between your kidneys, And uh, if you think about it, if you're coming from the front, right? You would see the kidneys, one and two, and you would see the pancreas kind of in front of it, in between. Um, there's your vertebra. Now, this is a strange-looking vertebra, right? But it's been very, I stretch this picture out a lot. But there's your spinous process right there, isn't it? There's the spinous process, and that would be the spinal cord going down a very strangely stretched out vertebra. Now, if you look at the kidneys here, you can see these layers of fat around it. And if I mark on this, it'll make, make, make it harder. But right around the kidney, right around the kidney would be a layer of the perinephric fat around the kidney. And then if you look on this image, you're going to see what's called the renal fascia. And it's just a layer, very, very thin layer, like I said, of almost like saran wrap that's kind of, kind of hold everything in place. And then there'll be another layer of fat, the paranephric fat, that is sort of even more external to all of this. Here's another azygous organ. What is this? Nothing to do with digestion, but that is what? Spleen. Okay. So the spleen, only one spleen, right? And again, look at all the fat. There's a lot of fat back in here, again, helping to protect the kidneys. So now we have an idea of what the kidney looks like and where it's found, um, or the urinary system. Here are those four structures again. I like tables, so I borrowed this from another textbook. But you can take a look at this, and you'll see in here just a description of the kidneys, uh, the ureters, the bladder, and the urethra. Nothing on here that's in addition to what you already haven't been told. So as I tried to convey in lab, we have two things to keep track of when we talk about the kidneys. One, we know that the kidneys are filtering your blood. So we've got to figure out how is it that blood gets into the kidneys and how is it that things are filtered and then get the blood back out of the kidneys. We'll start there. And then the second thing we'll have to figure out is once the blood filters the plasma, where does that filtrate go as it is forming urine? So we've got two pathways to keep track of. One, blood, and two, the filtrate that becomes the urine. So we'll start with the blood. So blood is going to come in to the kidney through the what? Renal artery. And like all arteries do, it's going to come in, it's going to split in many different branches, and we're not going to worry about those branches. So we're not going to worry about the names across the top four, the segmental, the arcuate. We're not going to worry about those names of arteries, same ones I crossed off in lab. Where we are going to pick up the story, though, is with a microscopic afferent arterial. Now we know the word afferent means what? To Think about it. Uh, where else have you heard the word afferent up till now? In the nervous system, right? The sensory neurons were called the afferent, right? And the sensory neurons are doing what? Coming from the outside and going in toward the central nervous system. And we also know that af means Toward and fair means to carry. So afferent, to carry toward. So the afferent arterioles are doing what? Carrying blood toward the kidney. We're down at the microscopic level here. So when we say blood is coming into the kidney, what I'm saying is that blood is coming down into the microscopic capillaries, and those capillary beds are called, each one is a glomerulus, 
many of them the glomeruli. So we have these little glomeruli. Now, what those glomeruli are are little balls. Right? Remember, glom means ball. So there are these red balls that we see in this picture on the right. So those are the two glomeruli that I'm seeing. And then as we discussed in lab, um, the blood is going to go into these glomeruli. What's unique about these glomeruli? What's unique about these capillaries? Let me say it again. They don't do gas exchange. Perfect. They, they are, um, there's no gas exchange going on here. So you do have red blood going in and red blood coming out. What is it about these capillaries that makes them special? What's the most common type of capillary? Continuous, right? These are not continuous. Instead, these capillaries are fenestrated, right? And remember that word fenestra means a window. These are capillaries with little holes in them, little gaps in them. And those are the very gaps that are, create the filtering capacity of the kidney. So blood is coming into these leaky capillaries, these fenestrated capillaries. Small molecules are going to be filtered through these little openings. And then what doesn't get filtered through is going to leave, isn't it? And it's going to leave out of the glomerulus through the efferent arterial. Right? So I'm always going to overemphasize afferent and efferent, just so you hear it. You may hear someone say afferent. Right? But it, I, I like the A and the E, just to make it really clear. So the efferent arterial leaving, going away from. Now, where is it going? Notice it's red. It's still red. It has not dropped off oxygen yet. So where is it going to go now? To another set of capillaries, right? So we got two capillaries in a row, the glomerulus and then a second set of capillaries. The first capillary is involved with filtration. The second capillary will be regular, continuous capillaries, where now we're going to do gas exchange. So there's a choice here of peritubular capillaries. And it says here that peritubular capillaries are only found in cortical nephrons. Absolutely true. I'll come back to that in a second. Or it can go to the vasa recta. And the vasa recta is a name of a capillary bed found only in juxtamedullary nephrons. Once we've done that gas exchange, then what? Then we come back out of the kidney through a series of veins, which gets larger and larger as they come out. Again, we're not going to worry about those names. And we're going to say, OK, now the blood's going to eventually leave out of the kidney out the renal vein. OK, so what I want us to focus on is just the blood coming in the renal artery and then the microscopic blood flow through the capillaries and the arterioles. That's what I want you to understand and appreciate. Now, let's back this up a little bit. And let's go over here to the right side. And I mentioned that there's two different types of capillary beds, peritubular and the vasa recta. We won't get into all the particulars this semester. We'll have a whole uh, lecture and a half, uh, maybe even two lectures in 106, over urinary physiology. It's a rather complex organ. It's not the most uh, exciting thing to look at, but what it's doing is pretty complex. And we won't be diving into that very much at all this semester. But if we look over here on the right, you see a color change. So everything above this is the cortex. Everything below this is the medulla. Right? We're, in, we're in one of these. We're like over here, right? We're looking, and we're looking at cortex on the top and medulla on the bottom. All of this tubing collectively is called a nephron. And this particular nephron on the left is more up in the cortex. Right? It's, it's kind of high up in the cortex. All of this tubing is up here, way up here. Now, there's only a little tiny bit that goes down, and that's that little bit of a, of a loop of Henle. But the vast majority of this nephron is up in the cortex, so it's called a cortical nephron. And what we see is that this cortical nephron has peritubular capillaries. What does that word mean to you? Peritubular, around the tubes. What tubes? Ah, oh, the convoluted tubules, right? So you see up there all that red and blue changing colors from red to blue. Those are the peritubular capillaries. And they're only found on 
cortical nephrons. Then, this nephron on the right, look at this one. Look where it's located. Its tubing is a little bit deeper, isn't it? It's down next to the medulla. So it's called a juxtamedullary nephron, next to the medulla. And it also has a much deeper loop of Henle. It goes way down in the medulla. And this is where you see the basa recta. So the basa recta is this capillary bed that you see wrapped around the loop of Henle in a juxtamedullary nephron. What does vasa recta mean? Ve, vas, vessel, recta, straight. Okay, so what are we seeing? That this, these vessels go straight down, if you will, right? They go straight down along the loop of Henle. Vasa recta, straight vessels versus peritubular, which is wrapped around the tubules of the nephron. Okay. So two types of nephrons, cortical and juxtamedullary. I won't go into the differences this semester, but, but uh, they do different things within the kidney, and they have slightly different architecture in that the cortical has the peritubulars and the juxtamedullary nephron has the vasa recta. So that's the blood flow, right? That's the blood. Now, the kidneys are receiving a very large percentage of your blood. Somewhere between 20 and 25% of all the blood coming up and off your heart, coming around the aorta, is going to make its branching out to the kidneys. So huge, right? Huge flow of blood every day, all the time. And what are the kidneys doing? They're filtering your blood. More specifically, they're filtering your... Right? More specifically, they're filtering the plasma, the liquidy portion of the blood. And as we've already said, say it again, it's really important, that the blood is going to go into the glomerulus, and it's going to come out of the glomerulus through the efferent arterial, and that efferent arterial is still red. It is still carrying oxygenated blood, because within the glomerulus, there is no gas exchange. This is all about filtering within the glomerulus. I've already said this, but now it's in words if you didn't catch it all. So the efferent arterial, it's still red, right? It's still carrying oxygen. Now it's going to go and deliver oxygen at one of two capillary beds, either peritubular, again, where are those? Cortical, cortex, versus vasa recta, which are those thin, straight-down tubes that project down in the medulla around the loops of Henle. And either of these are the true gas-exchanging and nutrient-exchanging. Remember, capillaries are not only dropping off oxygen. We've kind of gotten ourselves trained to think, okay, gas exchange, because we can easily see red going to blue or blue going to red. But don't forget that this is also where nutrients are dropped off. So it's in the peritubular capillaries in the vasa recta that the kidney is being fed glucose and other nutrients. So that gets us through the blood flow, right? Go back and look at that. Know that sequence of blood in and out of the kidney. But now we have to figure out what, the, what happens with what is filtered. And the magical uh, unit, the magical portion of the kidney that does all the work is the nephron. Now, there are two and a half million of these nephrons in your two kidneys, and they are, quote, the functional unit. The nephron is really a series of tubes, and we're going to break those tubes in those parts into four parts. Uh, the renal corpuscle, we'll start it here, and we'll go through with each of these. The renal corpuscle, what would you say the renal corpuscle is? We know it. We know a little bit more than this. The renal corpuscle is made up of the glomerulus, right, the ball of capillaries sitting inside the Bowman's capsule, right? So the Bowman's capsule plus the glomerulus, that makes up the renal corpuscle. And then the tubing continues out the proximal convoluted tubule, down the nephron loop. This is also called the loop of Henle, H-E-N-L-E. And then back up through the distal convoluted tubule. All of that, all four parts, 
could be just referred to as the renal tubule, right? The tube within the kidney. But there's two and a half million of these tube collections. Well, if I could stretch out each of these nephrons in a linear straight line, they would be about five centimeters long. Okay, metric, two inches. Right? So in English, about two inches long. So that means you have about five million inches of tubing squeezed into your two kidneys. I don't know how many miles it is, but that's pretty impressive. Right? It's a lot of tubing. So what did you see when we sliced into the kidney in the lab? Under the, under the microscope, what do you see when you slice into the kidney? Tubes, right? Proximal tubules, distal tubules, and loops of Henle all tightly packed into the kidney. And what are the majority of those tubes lined with? What kind of epithelium? Remember, the kidney was the primo place to find simple cuboidal. And it was always arranged in a circular pattern, right? It was, it was inside a tube. Okay, so when we see, the, well, sh I'll show it to you again. But we'll re we're being reminded that if I look at a slice of kidney, what I'm li largely going to see is simple cuboidal epithelium inside a bunch of densely packed tubes. And I've also, also already said this to you uh, back a ways, that there are two types of nephrons. Cortical, they have the peritubular capillaries, and juxtamedullary, which have instead the vasa recta. So let's go through each part of the nephron. And as I'm going through this, uh, make sure you can you know, point to it in a picture, but also I'll be telling you a little bit about what each portion of the nephron is responsible for doing as it's creating urine in your body. So number one, the renal corpuscle, you know it as the glomerulus, that ball of leaky capillaries sitting inside the Bowman's capsule, right? And you know, as we've already discussed, that those capillaries are fenestrated. That means they have openings, little gaps in them, which is going to allow for molecules to leak out or be filtered through these little gaps. When you think of capillaries, I've sort of told you to think about a very delicate structure that cannot withstand a very high blood pressure, right? We've, we talked about how blood pressure is very low when it gets down to capillaries, and that if the pressure is too high, that the capillary can be destroyed, right, under the high pressure. And in the, in the capillary of the kidneys, in these glomeruli, we've got capillaries, weak, but they have holes in them, but they're also under more pressure than most capillaries. And so to help prevent damage, there are additional cells here called podocytes. Again, we can break that down. It's a cell with what? Feet, right? Foot-like structures. And these foot-like structures are going to wrap around the glomerular capillary walls and not completely cover them, but protect them pretty well. And while they're uh, sliding around the capillaries, they're also going to create this really cool arrangement called filtration slits. And these filtration slits are going to act as a second layer of fenestrations or of a second layer of filtering capacity. So here we're looking at just a couple little uh, capillaries within the glomerular bed, right? The, the glomerulus is a, is a ball, right? Many, many capillaries in a ball. And we're looking at just a couple of them here. And there's this big old podocyte. And it's sitting here. And there's this nucleus. And, and it has these long foot-like extensions. And it doesn't completely wrap around the capillary, but does create these really interesting filtration slits. So that when molecules are traveling through the glomerulus, small molecules that are being filtered out must pass through not only the fenestrations, but also must squiggle through these filtration slits. So it's really a double layer of filter paper, if you will. One created by the fenestrations, the other little holes created by the filtration slits of the podocyte. Only really, really small molecules can get through. And, and that'll be, just for now, no small things like water, amino acids, small proteins, only very, very small things are small enough to get through those openings. Certainly not big enough 
for blood cells to get through. Right? You would never, never, never expect to see blood in normal urine. Now, you might see blood in your urine if you've got kidney damage because the kidneys can no longer filter the blood adequately. But under, in a normal kidney, you shouldn't see blood or cells or lots of protein. So let's review. The, this is sort of a blood flow as well as urine formation uh, combination. So blood's going to come in to the microscopic afferent arterial. If you have 2.5 million nephrons, that means you also would have 2.5 million afferent arterioles, bringing that blood individually into each. We can always recognize the afferent arterial because compared to the efferent, it will always be bigger in diameter because more blood goes in than what comes out. So on the models, afferent bigger, efferent on the way out smaller. The blood's going to come in to this leaky set of capillaries. Those leaky capillaries are protected. You can see the filtration slits caused by the podocytes. The little, um, you can even see the little nuclei in this picture of the podocytes. The little, those are the nuclei of the, of the podocyte. Now, what does not get filtered again is released back out the efferent arterial. And where is that blood going? If it leaves the glomerulus out the efferent arterial, it's still red blood, so it's going to go where? to the next set of capillaries, right? Peritubular or vasa recta. Now, anything that gets through those small openings is going to find itself up in this area, right? Around the outside. And this is referred to as the capsular space. And that's going to be filtrate, right? That's not going to be urine yet. This is not urine yet. This is just the stuff that got filtered through the openings. And that filtrate will continue its journey and start going down the what? Start going down the beginning of the proximal convoluted tubule. And you can even see in this drawing that the proximal convoluted tubule is lined by what? Simple cuboidal epithelium. Okay. Under the microscope, this is just a small little fragment, pretty high magnification. What we're seeing here, tube. Tube, 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 tube. I mean, just densely packed tubes lined by simple cuboidal. And then here's this big structure here. And that is actually the glomerulus. So what's on the inside would be the capillaries of the glomerulus. And that white space going around would be some of that, be the same as this capsular space. Right, so you're seeing a little outline, a little white halo around the glomerulus. So now the filtrate has moved through the filtering glomeruli and is heading down the proximal convoluted tubule. The job here is to reabsorb. So there's our key word. We're going to be reabsorbing. That's the major job of the proximal convoluted tubule. You might see it marked as PCT, the proximal convoluted tubule. So what's the issue here? The issue is this. The kidneys are constantly filtering. In fact, I'm going to write this down, not for you to remember it, but just to appreciate every day your kidneys are creating well, guys, about 180 liters per day. Ladies, about 150 liters per day. That's a filtrate. How many liters of blood do you have? Five. Of your five liters of blood, how much is water? Two or three, half of it. So of those three liters of plasma that you have in your body being constantly going around your circulatory system and constantly being filtered, you are making 150 to 180 liters of filtrate every day. Whoa. We'd be in the bathroom all day, right? We would die of dehydration in moments, in just a few minutes. So what must the body do? We're trying to get rid of waste products, right? We're trying to get rid of these metabolic waste products. And they're going to slip through these little cracks. But what must the body do? Take back what it needs. 
So it has to reclaim the water, it has to reclaim the nutrients, it has to reclaim the electrolytes. Everything that squiggled through those small openings that's of use to the body must be recaptured, reabsorbed. The waste products are going to continue their journey down the tube, right? But we want to capture back. And most of this recapturing, this reclaiming, this reabsorption is happening in the proximal convoluted tubules. In fact, this is where the vast majority of the water will be automatically reabsorbed. About 65% of the water will be automatically reabsorbed here by osmosis. We know osmosis, the movement of water across the membrane. This doesn't involve any hormones. This is just magic. Uh, uh, this is just background constitutive, always happening process. Now, when I say that things are being reabsorbed from the tube, where are they going? I need you to fill the gap in here. If if things are in the proximal convoluted tubule. And I'm saying to you that the body is reabsorbing them. How is it getting them back? Those molecules are being returned to the circulation through the peritubular capillaries. Okay, and I'm gonna I'm gonna show that to you in a picture. So the things that are being returned, the solutes in the water that are returned, are going to be returned via the peritubular capillaries. I'm gonna go back a couple of slides and hopefully help you see this. Going back to this slide that we saw already. Follow with me with the tubing. So here is the nephron, right, or the, the glomerulus. And the filtrate is going to start going down the proximal tubule, isn't it? So it's in that proximal tubule that what's happening? Reabsorption. What's surrounding that tubule? Cuboidal cells, yes, but what else is outside of those tubes? Those peritubular capillaries. So as water and as solutes are taken from the tubule and reclaimed back into the bloodstream, they're making their way back into these peritubular capillaries. Because what do we know about capillaries? Things exchange there, don't they? So there's a lot of exchange. In this case, not only, think about it, there's two things going on here. The peritubular capillaries are dropping off oxygen and they're dropping off nutrients, but they're also picking up water and they're picking up these reclaimed solutes. It's a pretty busy highway right in that, that area. So when I say that the solutes and water are being reclaimed by the peritubular capillaries, hopefully now you can appreciate kind of what that looks like. Mostly. I'm not going to say only. I'm going to say that the majority of this, 65% of this, is going to happen here in the proximal. In the loop of Henle and in the distal convoluted tubule, there'll still be some more of this going on. But the primary job of the PCT is reabsorption. Okay, There is still going to be some selective reabsorption along the loop of Henle. There's still going to be some selective reabsorption in the distal convoluted tubules. Okay, But... We're going to be thinking here, my majority, if I say proximal convoluted tubule, I want you thinking, ah, reabsorption. Then where is the filtrate going? We're still not urine. We're still making changes. So now we're going to head down the loop of Henley. I'm not going to get into this. That'll be, this will be a big part of next semester. The loop of Henley is going way down in the medulla, isn't it? And um, sort of like when you dive down into a swimming pool, what happens as you go deeper in the deep end? The pressure gets greater and greater, doesn't it? And the same thing kind of happens in the kidney. So as the, the filtrate is traveling down the loop of Henle, as it goes down the loop of Henle, the pressure increases. And as the pressure increases, certain molecules will sort of be pushed out of the tubule. I, I'm not going to go any more than that. It's a very complicated story in the loop of Henley that we're going to just gloss right over. Just know that further modifications are still happening. Right? We're still making changes down in the nephron loop. 
Now, the nephron loop can be divided into two parts, the descending side and the ascending side, referred to as the descending limb and the ascending limb, just the down and the back up portions. And then where do we find ourselves? The filtrate, if you were now in the tube after the loop of Henle, now you would be in the distal convoluted tubule. Yeah, there's still, there's still a little bit of reabsorption going on here, no doubt. But the new unique thing that's happening in the distal convoluted tubule is the process of secretion. So that's the word I want you to think about for the DCT, for the distal convoluted tubule, I want you to think about the process of secretion. Now, secretion is the opposite of reabsorption. Secretion is the opposite of reabsorption. So let's think about that. What's reabsorption? Taking things from the tube and putting them into the blood, back into the blood, reclaiming, re recycling. That means that secretion must be what? Taking things from the blood and putting them directly into the tubes. Again, we're in the DCT, and what's wrapped around the DCT are the peritubular capillaries. So also, in that big mess of capillaries and tubes, we've got the process of secretion. Again, we're moving things directly from the blood into the tube. For this conversation, I don't want you to worry about potassium. So for all I care, you can cross off potassium. But I do want you to think about acid, H+. Because this brings together a concept we talked about back in lab two, and that is pH. Remember we said that something that is more acidic has a lower pH and has more of what? Hydrogen. Hydrogen ion, right? So when I say that there is acid, if I say the word acid, you can also in your head replace it with H+, right? Because more hydrogen is more acidic, more acid. What is your pH of blood? pH of urine. Anybody, any idea? It ranges quite a bit, but it's definitely acidic. Four, I'm saying 4 to 7, 4-7, okay? So it's 4 to 7. It's, it's, it's neutral at best and usually quite acidic. Okay, so our blood has to stay at 7.4, right? There's not much room. There's not much wiggle room for our blood pH. So what am I telling you? How does the body keep the blood pH so tightly regulated at 7.4? It must have a way of getting rid of that extra acid. The kidneys are getting rid of that extra acid. In fact, there's so much acid that the kidneys have to use secretion. So what's secretion? Taking acid from the blood and putting it directly into what will become the urine. Say that again. Secretion, right, is the process of taking something from the blood and putting it into the tube. The molecule that I, the only molecule I want you thinking about for this semester that is involving secretion is acid. The body has to keep blood pH at 7.4. To do that well, it has to have an outlet of getting rid of extra acid. The kidneys are doing that for us. And to make sure it keeps the blood at 7.4, it is able to take the acid directly from the blood through the process of secretion and dump it directly into what will become the urine. So your urine pH can be quite low. It can be 3, 4. It can be rather acidic or not, largely based upon your metabolism and what you ate yesterday right, or earlier today. So there's a lot of changes in your diet, but your blood pH must stay around 7.4. Now, there's still reabsorption going on. I'm not saying there isn't reabsorption, right? Um, but the new unique thing that's happening in the distal convoluted tubule is this thing called secretion. There's still water movement, but here the water movement is under hormonal control. Now, for, again, for this course, you can go ahead and cross off aldosterone. I'm not going to talk about aldosterone. We'll save that story for next semester. But I do want you to know about ADH. 
ADH, antidiuretic hormone. Does anyone recall anything about ADH? You hear anything about it anywhere in your endocrine take-home exam? Did it come up a little bit? ADH is made by the hypothalamus. And ADH, what does it do? Antidiuresis doesn't allow you to urinate, right? It's going to, right? It's going to, it's going to allow, it's going to make your body hold on to water. Diuresis is, uh, is urination, getting rid of water. So antidiuresis, holding on to water. When would your body hold on to water? When you are dehydrated. So when you're dehydrated, guess what your hypothalamus does? Releases ADH. And what does that ADH tell your kidney? Don't urinate as much water. This happens in the distal convoluted tubule. So when the kidney is going to try to grab more water, retain water, it's going to do so through hormonal control of ADH, and it's going to cause the body to reabsorb more water. Now, what if the body is already well hydrated? If there's no hydration issues in the body, then ADH is not made, is it? And your urine output is larger, higher. You, you urinate more when you're well hydrated. But if you're dehydrated, your body's going to suck that water back and keep it, isn't it? Okay. So the hormonal control of water regulation occurs in the DCT, in the distal convoluted tubule, plus the process of secretion. Let's take a look here at a pyramid. This is like a pyramid, isn't it? Sort of a simplified cartoon. If we're thinking about the model upstairs, this is the middle panel. So we're looking at a pyramid. Cortex and medulla. Again, if I look at these two uh, nephrons, which type is which? This one over here. The tubing all seems to be kind of high with a very wimpy loop of Henle, so that is a cortical nephron. Over here, the tubing seems to be a little lower with a long, deep loop of Henle, so that is a juxtamedullary nephron. And remember that the nephron, uh, the tubing ends at the distal convoluted tubule, but then the convoluted tubule does what? Dumps that fluid, that filtrate, into a collecting duct. Now, upstairs, both of the models show a single collecting duct coming down the center. This diagram shows two collecting ducts. There'd be many. And these collecting ducts now are going to drip what is now urine. This is now urine by the time it gets here. And it's going to drip it out of what's called the renal papilla. OK, what's, a, what's papilla? Nipple-shaped structure, right? So it's like a little drip spout. This little drip spout, the, the urine is now dripping out of the apex. And what would be collecting it? The minor calyx. OK, so we're picturing this. So leaving from the, from the pyramid uh, out of the collecting ducts at the renal papilla would be the, the minor calyx now collecting that urine. Now, I'm not going to ask you to know the difference under the microscope. If I slice through a nephron, I might see something that looks like this. I, I would have a difficult time determining if a tube was a proximal tubule or a distal tubule or a loop of Henle. But I want you to appreciate this. Under higher magnification, what's going on in the proximal convoluted tubule primarily? What's going on? Reabsorption. And just like when your gut is absorbing nutrients, what do you think you would see lining the proximal convoluted tubule. Not only simple cuboidal epithelium, but those epithelium would have a lot of microvilli. Why? For the reabsorption. It's increasing the surface area to give me more area to reabsorb all that water and all of those solutes. Once I go down to the distal convoluted tubule, on the, le on the right hand side, there would be far fewer microvilli. Right? Grandpa's head. Right? Getting a little bald there. So what's going on there? There's not as much reabsorption going on, so I don't need as many microvilli. I can't see that up here, honestly. We don't have the magnification to see that up in here. But if I could zoom in really, really close, 
I would then be able to tell the difference between the PCT and the DCT by the presence or absence or the density of the microvilla. So now we're in the collecting ducts. Uh, the urine has gone all the way through the nephron. It's now in the collecting ducts. And this is still the last chance for the body to gather more water. We're urine. This is urine. There's no more movement of sodium and potassium, no more movement or reabsorption or secretion of anything. But in the collecting ducts, if a person is dehydrated, the body can still, along the collecting duct, reabsorb even more water. Again, this is going to be under ADH hormone control. So if you're super dehydrated, right, you're going to keep getting more concentrated urine. And we've all had those days. Right? We don't drink enough water, we're outside, we're exercising, we become dehydrated, our urine becomes very low, right? the amount of flow is low, and our urine is very dark and very concentrated. So on those days, you know that your collecting ducts were busy sucking all the last little bit of water it could out of your urine and concentrating it to the best of its ability. If you're well hydrated, flush, let it go. Right? The body's not recapturing water. If you're well hydrated, your kidneys are just constantly flushing, and you're not collecting more water out of it. Again, the hormone that would tell your body to retain more water would be our friend ADH. So ADH, ADH, ADH. Uh, again, what are the four parts of a nephron? Four parts of the nephron. Renal corpuscle, right? the glomerulus plus the Bowman's capsule, the PCT, the lupapenle, and the DCT. Just kind of run you through it. I, again, I like tables. Read through it. Nothing, nothing there, though, that I haven't already shared with you in the other slides. You shouldn't be surprised that the kidney has innervation. There are nerves going to the kidneys, right? So the autonomic nervous system is definitely going to communicate uh, with the kidneys. And this group of nerves going to the kidneys would be called the renal plexus. The group of nerves going to the heart would be called the cardiac plexus, right? The group of nerves going to the lung would be called the pulmonary plexus. So just another general term, if you will. Remember, a plexus is a what? Group of nerves, right? So a plexus is a group of nerves traveling together. What nerve do you think is involved with this? What nerve have we learned about? What cranial nerve have we learned about that wanders all the way down into the gut? Vagus. The vagus. The vagus nerve stops in at the kidney as well. What do we learn about sympathetic and parasympathetic? During sympathetic, what happens? More blood is going to your muscles. Less blood is going to your urinary system. I said that. but. I don't want you to ever think that it gets turned off. It never gets turned off. You cannot turn off the blood flow to your kidneys. You have to keep filtering your blood. No choice. But less blood would be going to your kidneys. During a parasympathetic moment, right? Not as much stress, rest and digest. Now what? What's going to happen? Less blood going to your muscles and more blood now available to be filtered by your kidneys. So your urine output will increase when you're relaxed. Your urine output will increase during a parasympathetic time. And the vagus nerve is part of that, that, that signaling that tells the, urine, the urinary system to get busier or not as busy is definitely communicated partly through the vagus nerve. Let me take a break here, and then we'll finish off. We'll, we'll finish with the kidney. We're done with the kidney. And we're just going to go through the urinary tract, go down the ureter to the bladder and out the urethra. And then we'll talk about a couple more unifying ideas, and we'll be done with the kidney. Any questions, though, right now on blood flow or formation of? It's still a very generic story. There's not a lot of detail here. There really isn't. But I'm trying to make this very non-complex this semester. But is there any question on blood flow or fluid flow? OK, let's take a few minutes. And we'll come back and pick up with the urinary tract. So we've gotten through the kidney. We've talked about the blood flow and the filtration process of making urine. Uh, we know about the parts of the nephron. And we have a little bit of an idea that as filtrate is traveling through, 
Some things are being added, some things are being taken away, and water is being sucked away. So by the time we get through all the nephron, now we have concentrated waste products that we call urine. So where is it heading? It's going to head down what we would call the urinary tract. And this is going to start with those ureters. You know that there's one ureter coming out of the hilum, going down from each kidney down to the bladder. We're talking about 25 centimeters. So, you know, what is that, about 10 inches? So these are pretty long tubes. And, you know, a taller person like myself, probably uh, even longer. And again, the, the ureters are themselves retroperitoneal. Now, the wall of the ureter, if I could cut into the ureter, I would see three layers, three tunics. You're not surprised by this. Look what they're called. The inner layer, mucosa. There is no submucosa. Now, the way I think about this is in the intestine, what did the submucosal layer do? What was in the submucosal layer? Remember the mucosa was the epithelial layer, the submucosa where all the blood vessels were for the absorption? Well, are we absorbing anything through the ureter? No, it is truly a tube. It is simply conveying urine from the kidney down to the bladder. So the way I remember this is there is no absorption. There's no need for uh, a, a, a submucosal layer, if you will. So we go right from mucosa down to a muscularis, a muscle layer, and then an adventitia. Now, why can't we call this a serosa? Remember the outer layer was called serosa in the intestines. Why wouldn't I have a serosa around the ureter? Say it again. Mm, no, I thought I heard the... There's no serosa because there's no serous membrane because this is retroperitoneal. We're behind the peritoneum. If we were inside the peritoneum, then there'd be wrapped around it serous membrane. All right? But because we're outside, there is no serous membrane, so we can't call it serosa. So they got together and called it instead adventitia. I, I wish it made more, you know, that's why. I wish the word meant more to me or to you. If I cut into the ureter, what's it kind of look like? What have you seen that looks a little bit like this? And I would never ask you to identify this, so don't, don't stress out about that. But this kind of looks like, in a way, the intestine, right? Kind of does. A little bit. Um, but... All we're doing is cutting through the ureter, and again, all we have is a layer of mucosa on the inside, and then a muscularis layer, muscle, and then the outside layer, the adventitia. Now, there's a special kind of epithelium here that I think I've mentioned, but it never had you learn. You don't have to recognize it now, but both the bladder and the ureter are lined by transitional epithelium. Okay, I won't ask you to recognize it, but I want you to know about it. Transitional epithelium is named as such because it can, quote, transition from appearing as a simple epithelium to being a more stratified epithelium. If the bladder is empty or the bladder is full. As the bladder is full, that outer layer thins out into more of a simple layer. As the bladder empties, it kind of jumbles up and appears more as a stratified layer. So it transitions back and forth daily, many, many times. And so it's called transitional epithelium, and that's what's lining both the ureter and the bladder. Going down to the bladder, again, uh, it is protected, as you know, uh, by the, behind the pubic symphysis. And in the female, the bladder is in direct connection with the uterus. And in the male, uh, we've got the prostate gland that we've seen that is connected right to the bladder. We know that it's retroperitoneal, as is everything else, and when the bladder is empty, it resembles more of an upside-down pyramid, and when it's full, it becomes more oval in shape as it extends or distends more superiorly, and again, it, it, as it fills, it becomes more um, thin in the layering. Now, if I cut open into the triangle, or sorry, if I cut open into the bladder, I'm going to see a triangular arrangement, and it's called the trigone. Um, it's easier to show it in the pictures, I think, but I'll point it out here in words. So the trigone is this triangular region within the bladder, and really what it is, the, 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 the 
the triangle, you've got two openings for the two ureters coming down to the bladder. And then there's the opening going down the urethra. And so that, tri that, that triangular region is called the trigone. So it really kind of acts, it's an imaginary triangle, if you will. I mean, you can see the openings, and it's kind of functioning as a funnel. And what is that funnel doing? As the bladder fills, that urine is pushing down on what? What's at the base of the bladder? What's found right here where I'm circling? The internal urethral sphincter. So as the bladder is filling, there's more urine pushing down on that uh, internal sphincter. There are four layers around the bladder. There is a submucosa. Let's take a look at the bladder. So this layer here, this is the peritoneum. That's the peritoneum. So we say that the bladder is retroperitoneal, but actually, in this case, the bladder is underneath. It's not behind the peritoneum, but it's sort of underneath your abdominal pelvic cavity, sitting way down in the, in the pelvis. Uh, here are the two ureters coming down, and they're going to empty in right here. So there are the openings for the two ureters. And then leaving, there's the internal sphincter, and again, there's that trigone, that triangular arrangement inside the, ki uh, the kidney, the bladder, sorry. This uh, does not have a prostate gland here, so I'm going to assume that this is a female. And in the female, or in the male too, there's a band of muscle called the urogenital diaphragm. And in that layer, there would be a sphincter right here. Imagine it going around the entire urethra, and that would be the what? External urethral sphincter. This one up here, the internal is involuntary muscle, giving you the urge to go as urine pushes down on it as it fills. And then the external sphincter is voluntary muscle, over which you hopefully have control. There is lining the bladder. Lining the bladder, this muscle layer. The bladder is partially smooth muscle, right? It's, it's involuntary but there's also a layer of voluntary muscle around your bladder, and partly, partly voluntary, called the detrusor muscle. Now, what does that word detruse mean? We learned it way long ago in the Ds. Detruse means to push away. So this muscle, the detrusor muscle, is the one that allows you to, 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 to void, right, to push and to, and to empty the bladder. Not that I would have you recognize it, but this is transitional epithelium. It, it, again, not to, not to recognize it, but it's just a different looking epithelium. Uh, here's your empty bladder, kind of an upside down pyramid. Here's your full bladder as it begins to extend upward more superiorly. The overall process of urination is also called micturition. So you hear the word micturition or the micturition reflex, it's referring to the reflex of urination. <coughs> That's the removal of urine from the bladder. And it's actually a reflex, meaning what? Reflex to you means what? Involuntary, happens the same way over and over, and that's true. There is a component of this which is reflexive, that is out of your control but we do have control over the external sphincter. But we all realize, right, that that can't always be enough. And so it is possible, right, for the reflex to sort of take over, if you will, the voluntary so, muscle. So if you are, if your bladder is so full, right, it is very possible for you to not have control, right, to lose control. So we recognize that it's a reflex as if it's involuntary. We have control over it to a point and we can allow for that reflex to continue voluntarily, um, hopefully at the right time. Now, the whole thing is based upon stretch receptors. Uh, these receptors are in the bladder wall. And we've talked about this a little bit. So as the bladder fills, uh, those stretch receptors are activated. 
and those stretch receptors are now going to relax the internal sphincter. Right? That's your smooth muscle. You don't have control over that. And then you hopefully match that with conscious, voluntary relaxation of the detrusor muscle. So then you open up your external sphincter and you squeeze with the detrusor muscle and you assist that reflex. The urine is going to leave out the urethra. Again, this is a mucous membrane. It's an epithelial lined tube. Lots of muscle along the way to help push the urine. And we've already talked about the two sphincters. So there's the internal and the external sphincter. And here I just have more information about those. We've talked about those in the past. So there's the internal involuntary sphincter right at the uh, bottom or the neck of the bladder. And then there's the external sphincter that's found within that urogenital diaphragm layer. The female urethra has one and only function, that is for the passage of urine. It's relatively short, uh, one and a half to two inches long, and it opens um, into the perineum. Now, the perineum I'll describe next week, but, or, or next time, but the perineum, if you spread your legs, there's a diamond-shaped region between the thighs referred to as the perineum. And clearly, that's where the urethra is emptying into or out of the body. So as we look at this, um, I know it's a female for a couple of reasons. It says so, but also, um, I don't see a what? I don't see a prostate gland. That would be right here, wouldn't it? And I also see that it's labeled labia major and labia minor. So a relatively short uh, urethra, and this band of tissue right here is the urogenital diaphragm. And within that band of tissue going around the urethra would be the external sphincter. The internal sphincter would be here at the beginning of the urethra. Again, detrusor muscle would be in the wall, and there's that trigone, that triangular region within the bladder. The male urethra is significantly longer. It has both purposes for the passage of urine and for the passage of semen. It's broken into three parts. The part that's going through the prostate itself. Remember, the male urethra passes right through the middle of that walnut-shaped prostate. That's going to be called the prostatic urethra, that little section. Then there's a little tiny section called the membranous urethra. It's the shortest. It's going to be in that urogenital diaphragm area. So as the urethra passes through the urogenital diaphragm, that is the membranous section. And then the rest of it is going to be referred to either as the spongy urethra or the penile urethra. And it's called the spongy urethra because along the length of the urethra, it is enclosed uh, by the corpus spongiosum, the corpus spongiosum. So it's called the spongy urethra, and that is going to extend all the way into the opening at the glands of the penis at the end. So looking at the three parts, again, uh, same thing as, as the female, still have my trigone, I still have my detrusor muscle in the bladder, and I still have my internal sphincter at the top of the bladder. The prostate gland, and then going through the prostate, the blue area, that's the prostatic urethra. The part of the urethra that's passing through this little narrow region, that is the urogenital diaphragm. And so there I have the external sphincter, and that's the membranous urethra. And then the majority of it, the purple, is the penile or spongy urethra. That's pretty much the anatomy and the, and the whole story. I just have a few more slides to share with you. I really don't have that much more to go. Um, some global ideas here. And then a few more, you know, things to kind of integrate some, some uh, things. That, there'll be a couple slides also coming up I'm going to tell you just to cross off and completely ignore. So I'll be listening for that. So if I talk about overall urine production, what steps are necessary to create urine? Number one, I have to filter the blood. So when I say filtration, what part of the nephron is involved?
glomerulus, right? Filtration, the filtering process is happening in the glomerulus in the renal corpuscle. And that is, again, what happened? We collected water and we collected ions and small molecules out of the blood. What do we call that stuff? At that point, we call that stuff filtrate. It's not yet urine. We're still going to add and subtract from it before we call it urine. Don't worry about the pressures, right? Don't worry about the pressures, but we recognize that this is happening in the glomerulus. I'm going to have you cross this slide off, so let's not worry about this one at all. This slide, all I want you to appreciate, let's just label some things here. So blood is coming in what? What is this? Afferent arterial, right? It's coming into the leaky capillaries and then going out the efferent arterial. And then there's going to be some pressure differences. I told you that there's quite a bit of pressure coming in to the glomerulus, and that pressure is what's keeping urine pushing down your ureters and toward your bladder. What if you stood on your head for a long time? Or what if you're an astronaut? You're in a zero-gravity environment, right? Would you still have urine pushing toward your bladder? Yeah, right? You still have blood coming in. Even if you're standing on your head for an hour, you're still going to have blood coming in, and that blood coming in is still going to create a pressure, which is still going to keep filtrate pushing through your tubules and down to your bladder. That's all I want you to see. Don't worry about the names of the pressures or the numbers or anything else. Just realize you're, just, you're still going to urinate if you're on your head. That's really all I want to say here. <coughs> then after we do the filtering, the next job is reabsorption. And what is reabsorption? Taking things from the filtrate and reclaiming them back into the bloodstream. And the two things that are being reclaimed are water. And that's going to move via osmosis. And a lot of proteins and glucose and electrolytes like sodium, potassium, chloride, calcium, those sorts of things are also going to be reabsorbed. Where does this primarily happen? The proximal convoluted tubule. Where does it also happen? Loop of Henle and DCT. OK? Cross this one off. Don't read it at all. Don't worry about it. Cross this one off. And then the process of secretion. Again, what is that? It's kind of as a review. Secretion is what? The removing of stuff from the blood and putting it into what will become the urine. And the, the molecule I want you to think about is, again, how does the body get rid of unwanted acid? And it's going to get rid of that excess acid by filtering, but also there's so much acid that it's going to take some by secretion and put it directly into the tubule. Again, taking stuff out of the blood and putting it into the tube, that will become the urine. So this is a, a, a very simplified nephron. So let's take a look. What do we have here? Blood coming in, afferent arterial. We know this. Blood leaving, efferent arterial. Where is it going? This efferent arterial is then going to travel to the peritubular capillaries if it's a cortical nephron, right? Because that's what has the peritubular capillaries. What are the processes that happen in the nephron? Number one, this arrow represents what? Filtration, right? Because this represents a simplified looking Bowman's capsule. And while it doesn't show a whole bunch of capillaries, this is a simplified glomerulus, isn't it? Then what's the second process that's happening along the tube? Now, this tube is showing one straight downward tube. It looks like a wrench, right? The yellow looks like a wrench. But we're talking about all of this being a nephron that's been stretched out. 
So after filtration, what's the second thing that's going to happen? This arrow, number two, represents what? Reabsorption. Notice the direction of that arrow. Things are going from the tube into the blood of the peritubular capillaries. Number three process is secretion. Now look at the direction of that arrow. That arrow is taking stuff from the blood and putting it back into the tube. Secretion. Number four arrow is not labeled. I wish it was. What would we call the release of urine from your body? Excretion. Right, so excretion. So add it like a fourth. That last arrow would be excretion, the release of urine from the body through the bladder and the urethra. So that's the kidney in a nutshell. Now, here is uh, the one hormone we talked about, ADH. What did we say? ADH was made where? It's made up in the hypothalamus, yep. So it's made in the hypothalamus, and what does it do? It tells your body not to antidiuretics, not to urinate, so it's going to tell your body to retain water. And where in the kidney, where in the nephron, does ADH have its effect? Did it work on the proximal convoluted tubule? No, I didn't mention it there. The 65% of water that's, that's reabsorbed happens without hormonal concern. Where did I start mentioning ADH? In the distal tubules and even more in the collecting ducts. So what ADH does is it increases water uptake in the distal tubules and in the collecting ducts. And as a result, your body's going to retain more water. We're going to cross this one off. We'll save this story for next semester. So we won't talk about renin this semester. Yay. I told you we're going to skip aldosterone this semester, so we'll skip this story as well. And since we're not going to tell the story, we're not going to worry about the picture. I do like this hormone, though. This is a different hormone. I, I think I mentioned it in passing. ANP, atrial natriuretic hormone. Well, you tell me. What, what are the, what's that title telling you a little bit about? Atrial, from the atria, from the heart. Natrium is Latin for what element? Salt, sodium, right? N-A, that's why N-A is sodium, because from the Latin natrium. So this is a hormone that has something to do with sodium that's released from the heart. In fact, this hormone, ANP, and you'll see it ANH, I apologize, but you'll see it both ways, right? ANH or ANP, come on, is going to be released from the atria of the heart when blood pressure is too high. So your blood pressure is too high. It makes sense that the atria would be a good place to put a sensor in. So if the atria are being stretched too much because the blood pressure is too high, they're going to send out this hormone, ANH. And what this is going to do, ANH, is going to go through your bloodstream and go to your kidneys and decrease sodium reabsorption. It's going to decrease sodium reabsorption. In lab two, we learned that solutes suck. So if I'm going to decrease the reclaiming, the reuptake of sodium, that means that what? More sodium will stay in my urine and solutes, sodium, will, water will follow the sodium. So what will happen then to your urine output? If you don't reabsorb as much sodium, that means, again, more sodium will be in your urine and more water would follow 
right? So you'd suck the water out of your body. So as a result, you would increase your urination. And with more urine released, your blood pressure would go down. Okay, so ANP, hormone released by the heart. Why? Because the blood pressure is too high. How does it work? It travels to the kidney, tells the kidney don't reabsorb as much sodium. And as a result, you will urinate more water out and decrease your blood pressure. Make sense? It's a cool hormone. What else can cause you to urinate more? Here's two diuretics right here, alcohol and caffeine. So alcohol inhibits ADH. That's how it works, right? You drink alcohol, you're going to urinate more. It inhibits ADH. Okay. Well, why would the body ever put out ADH? It puts out ADH when you're dehydrated, right? Telling your body to retain water. This is why it's never a good idea. I guess Lake Michigan is not as much a problem because you can drink the water. But if you're out in the Gulf of Mexico and you don't have enough and it's hot and, the only, and you're already dehydrated because it's hot and the only thing you brought along was a, something with alcohol in it, not a good combination because you're already dehydrated and you're drinking alcohol. And what's the alcohol doing? Inhibiting ADH. When you're dehydrated, what does your body want to do? Release ADH and tell your body to hold on to the water. When you're drinking alcohol on a hot day, the ADH is no longer effective. So what are you going to do? Keep on urinating. You're going to increase your dehydration level. Okay? So regardless of the hot, regardless if you're in a boat or regardless if it's a hot day, the way that alcohol works is it inhibits ADH and you have more output, more urine. Caffeine, also a diuretic. It works in a different way, though. Caffeine works by inhibiting sodium reabsorption. Sounds exactly like what? What else, what else inhibited sodium reabsorption? AMP, right? Atrionatriuretic peptide. So caffeine and ANH do the same thing. Right? It's another diuretic. This is why there's a lot of concern about alcoholic drinks that have caffeine in them. Okay, so there, I mean, there's that move, right? I mean, people are slamming things together and mixing things, and there's even been some marketing of trying to get some monster with your know, alcohol with high caffeine levels in it. Well, what are you doing? You're doubling up on the diuretics, and these folks are very easily dehydrated. So there is a medical concern about people slamming caffeinated alcoholic drinks. Now you know why, right? You understand they're both diuretics. Lastly, what, is the, what are the kidneys trying to do? Keep, one of the things they're trying to do is keep your blood pH where? This scale's right in the middle. 7.4, right? 7.4. That's what your body and that's what your kidneys are trying to do. I'm not going to worry about the bicarb stuff on here. This is, well, yeah, I'll say it. This is bicarb. It's the same stuff you put in a hot tub or a pool. Um, and that's going to be a buffer to help protect the pH from changing. And then this molecule over here, this is carbonic acid. Now, carbonic acid, I want to tell you the story, then I want to go back to this. So carbonic acid, if you take CO2 plus water in your body, that is going to make, it's going to make carbonic acid. Okay, so what am I saying here? As your, as your body accumulates CO2, right, this is a normal waste product, and CO2 is carried in your blood. So as you have too much CO2, what happens to your blood pH? Too much CO2, your blood becomes more acidic, and your pH would go down, right? A lower pH. Okay, so let's take a look back at this picture then. 
So what is the body trying to do? If you had a lot of carbonic acid building up, H2CO3, again, what is that? That's going to make your blood more acidic, isn't it? And if you had bicarb, actually it can make your body more basic. If your blood starts to change, if your blood becomes too acidic, right? If, if your blood becomes acidic, we're going to say that you have acidosis. Acidosis would be any time your blood pH drops below a 7.35. If your blood pH goes down to a 6.8, you're dead. Remember that pH is a logarithmic scale, meaning that every number is a tenfold difference. So the difference between 7.4 and 6.4 is only a tenfold difference. You can't even get tenfold difference in your acid before you're dead. If your blood pH becomes too alkaline, you become what we call, you have alkalosis or you become alkalotic, then if your pH goes above 8, you're dead. There's not a huge swing here, right? So the body has got to keep the 7.4 right in the middle. And part of what the body does, part of what the kidneys do, is they help this balancing act, right? This is just showing a scale, not to worry about it too much, but just the idea that the kidneys are in this balancing act of keeping your acid and base levels level. And we've already seen that the kidneys have the ability of getting acid out of the body to help maintain your blood pH. So as we always finish up, what happens to a system as it gets old? Okay, well, starting around the age of 30, the kidney changes can start to be seen. There'll be a gradual decrease in the size of the kidneys. Again, very gradual, but a decrease. Therefore, there'll be less blood flow going to the kidneys. Now, if there's less blood flow, then there's less filtration, right? Less cleansing of your blood. You will have fewer nephrons. We just start losing nephrons through our life. Just like we lose neurons, we also lose nephrons. And basically, your ability to reabsorb and to secrete will be compromised, right? There'll be some less ability to cleanse your blood. Well, as a result of that, um, well, I should also say, you'll also have less, you would also have less ADH. So as all, everything else, right, as we get older, we'd have less ADH. Remember, we're going to cross off aldosterone, don't worry about it. But we'd have less ADH. In other words, less control over your urination. Okay. So if your kidneys aren't doing their job as efficiently, and you can't control your ADH fluid levels quite as well, then what are people going to start having issues with? blood pressure, right? Because if we can't control our kidneys well and our ADH levels are not as well maintained, then we might start seeing problems with fluid retention and with blood pressure issues. What's one thing we give to patients with high blood pressure? One round of medications would be medications called diuretics, right? So diuretics are medications that cause one to urinate quite a bit. And again, that fluid coming off the body is going to help at least keep the blood pressure a little bit more in check. The bladder size will decrease, so people have to go more frequently to the restroom. And if you think about males, uh, with the increase in the uh, prostate, which happens around age 50 and older, it starts to enlarge, again, what is that prostate doing? It's pushing up on the internal sphincter, giving the male the sensation that he has to go. So he's making frequent trips to the restroom, but he gets there and there's not much urine. So he has the urge to go, but no actual urine flow to do. And as the prostate enlarges, it can squeeze down on the urethra, which can interfere with normal flow. So you've got the urge to go, go, go. Nothing's there or flow issues. So that's one of the issues. And then again, as we get older, hopefully no time soon, we might lose control of our sphincters. Right? or our micturition reflex, which would lead us to not having control over this process. And that's why now Meyer has a whole row of adult diapers. Right? And hopefully none of us anytime soon right, will have to be wearing Depends, but that is why they are there. So that finishes up urinary system. What are you going to be working on over the weekend? You don't want to wait. Right? Let's not wait. 
I know you have your lab exam, but you don't want to completely put the lecture stuff on the, on the back burner. So over the weekend, if you, you guys were mostly here, remember I did that relatively short respiratory lecture. Go back and review that. Do the mastering assignment for that. Also, go back and look at your urinary mastering assignment. There is a mastering quiz um, for this. It's not due till after the lab practical. Your choice on that. But again, I would go in that darn thing and start looking at questions that are related to respiratory and urinary. Get those off your list. Then you only have the reproductive section left to do on that exam. Before I see you on Monday, though, for the exam, either at 2 or 7, you will do the PALS quiz. So there's a, there's a quiz on there. It's called PALS, uh, Practice Anatomy Lab. And um, it's going to have it's, it's pictures from models, and it's pictures from fetal pigs, and it's pictures from a human cadaver. And it's a great review. And I went through and I selected structures that are representative of what you'll see on the exam next week. So by doing that PALS quiz, you should feel much more comfortable about what to focus on for the lab exam next week. So do that. That's 10-point quiz. Open book, open resource. Do well in that. You can have your Amerman book or your uh, Amerman book open. Not a problem. That's what you're supposed to be doing. And then you have your one mastering quiz to do before the lecture exam next Wednesday. Um, I think I have that thing at Tuesday, due on Tuesday night. Does that seem right? Tuesday at midnight? I think I made it as late as I could so that you had as much time between the lab exam and the lecture exam. And what else? So that's the 200 points, right? There's 200 points left. 100 points, lab exam, 80 points, final exam, 10 points, PALS, 10 points, ma mastering quiz number six. 1,000 points, um, pretty easy to calculate your grade. Right now you've got 80% of your grade in, in your grade center. Any questions for me? Wow, we're done a whole five minutes early. <laughs>